wish I could do that more often. <clears throat> My name is Peter Drake. Uh, I'm here to welcome you to the 2022 New York Academy of Art Commencement Ceremony, and it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Eileen Guggenheim. Eileen got her PhD from Princeton University, and she has been, with her husband, one of the most ardent supporters of the Academy for at least 40 years. And I can say in complete honesty, this school would not exist without her, so please welcome Eileen Guggenheim. Thank you, Peter. Um, and I wanted to say, having seen the diploma show, congratulations to the great class of 2022. Um, I, I, I don't think we could talk enough about the two years that you were in graduate school and what was happening beyond the four walls of the New York Academy of Art. So I think you should all give yourselves extraordinarily uh, a huge credit for having persevered and succeeded and uh, come to this day uh, together. So congratulations from the bottom of my heart. Meanwhile, what brought you here at this day and at this time? How about if all of this magnificent class of 2022 stands up and faces the audience? Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, please please stay standing. Please stay standing and please stay focused on uh, the, your audience because I, I maintain that you're only here for one reason and that is that you got support from the people who you love and the people who loved you. So what I'd like to do is invite various people to stand up and this great class of 2022 is going to salute those of you who made this day possible. Anyone who's a parent of a graduate, please stand up. And remain standing. Remain standing. Okay. Now, remain standing, please. How about a grandparent? And he's, please remain standing. Grandparents, fantastic. <laughs> Sisters and brothers. Sisters and brothers. Woo <laughs> How about aunts and uncles? Aunts and uncles, none of those. Okay. <laughs> Significant others. Significant others. Um, I'm trying to get all of you, how about children? Everybody whose parent is great. And we just want to all salute all of you for, for everything you've done for the graduating class of 2022. Um, thank you. Okay, you may all sit down now. That was a... <laughs> And I would like to introduce now the president of the New York, uh, New York Academy of Art, David Kratz, uh, who I think a lot of you know has been a graduate, uh, graduated in 2008, is that right? Class of 2008. Um, and uh, he will give his remarks. Thanks. Oh, it's so great to be here today with all of you and with all of your families. Thank you for coming out in support of these incredible artists. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about what it's like to be an artist in these times. And even more, what it's like to be a person in these times. And normally I give this speech and it's kind of focused on launching your career you know, as an artist and what it's gonna be like after school. But I think today I wanna to talk about 
you know, how to live a life of creativity and worth and meaning in these times. And I, I, I had been thinking about this a lot, and then I heard this um, interview uh, that uh, Krista Tibbet did on NPR of a, a poet, priest, philosopher um, named Padraig Otuma, and their conversation crystallized so much of what I was thinking about. So I just want to talk about some of that, how to live a life of creativity and worth. First of all, I think truly the first requirement is to listen, to really listen to other people with the understanding that most people do what seems reasonable to them most of the time. And that if we can understand that the dynamics underneath the public things that people say, if we can understand that principle that they're doing what seems to be reasonable to them, maybe we can approach the conversation differently. If we can try to understand the hopes and fears that they bring that each person brings, all of us, to an issue. It doesn't mean you have to agree or condone, but if you do it with the generosity of listening, I think it would change a lot. And I think we're failed by the headlines and the social media and the, the amount of vitriol that demonizes the other, but I think we're upheld by discourse that emphasizes virtue. And, kindness and goodness, and that allows for the, the jostle and even the enjoyment of saying, yeah, we, d we disagree, but we do so in a, a, a safe space, in a communal space. And that seems important to me, especially because that's what the academy is. It's a community, and you have lived within its support and safety for these past two years, and you've lived well together. And in the context of the current world's imperfection and difficulty, I feel like we at the school have kept our sense of curiosity and a sense of wonder. And that allows us, on a day like today, to say hello to tomorrow, to something we wouldn't have known about before. So in that spirit, I want to read you something. Um, I don't know if it's a poem or a prayer. It's written by uh, this, this Irish poet and priest. And he identifies as Christian, but I think the spirituality he expresses is universal. And to me, it just resonated whether you're starting just your day or whether you're starting a new day in your studio. He says, neither I nor the poets I love found the, king, the keys to the kingdom of prayer. And we cannot force God to stumble over us where we sit, but I know it's a good idea to sit anyway. So every morning, I sit and kneel, waiting, making friends with the habit of listening, hoping that I am being listened to. There I greet God in my own disorder. I say hello to my chaos, my unmade decisions, my unmade bed, and I, my desire and my trouble. I say hello to distraction and privilege. I greet the day and I greet my beloved and bewildering Jesus. I recognize and greet my burdens, my luck, my controlled and uncontrollable story. I greet my untold stories, my unfolding story, my unloved body, my own love, my own body. I greet the things I think will happen and I say hello to everything I do not know about the day. I greet my own small world, and I hope that I can make that meet the bigger world that day. I greet my story, and I hope that I can forget my story during the day, and hope that I can hear some stories and greet some surprising stories during the long day ahead. I greet God, and I greet the God who is more God than the God I greet. Hello to you all, I say, hello to you all, as the sun rises above the chimneys of North Belfast, hello. So 
as we send you out from the school, I wish you courage. And I think courage, again, defined by this philosopher, is the mixture between fear and resolution. And it only exists when you do something about it. So fear is a fine beginning, but courage you have to let be your moving. So I say to you, may you have courage, may you go out and do something about it in whatever way is happiest, clearest, and most blessed for you. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our student speaker, Jackie Doika. My manifesto, I'm no, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you to the New York Academy of Art, FAM, for inviting me to speak on behalf of the graduating class of 2022. Congratulations to us. My name is Jackie Doika. Many of you I have met, multiple times in fact. The first time with a mask, the second time without. For an entire year, I got to know your eyes, your eyebrows, your foreheads, your hairstyles, and thanks to my brain's encyclopedia of actors' facial features, I was able to fill in the rest. In those first months of fall 2020, when we lined up our self-portrait painting assignments, we could only critique each other on formal qualities, not likeness, because we did not, in fact, really know what the other looked like, and we did not know, really, what would happen in our world. And in the midst of all of this uncertainty, we committed ourselves to our education. We are very lucky that the Academy was able to keep its doors open, so thank you to administration for keeping things going and going in person. <laughs> However, that good fortune did not make the task any simpler. You want to become a master of your craft and a contemporary artist with a unique vision? Then you must learn how to manage your ambition. You have to step into the classroom with enough humility to learn, balanced by enough confidence to keep going, despite the recognizable distance between where you are and where you want to be. Back in the Renaissance, if you wanted to become an artist, you started as an apprentice. You studied under a master, painted in their style, and made copies of their work. In exchange, they provided you with food, clothing, and shelter, all while giving you free instruction. Sweet deal, right? I don't want to romanticize these times too much, though. First of all, there were no antibiotics, no vaccines for the plague, and circumstances were lesser for marginalized people like Artemisia Gentileschi or Juan de Pereja, depicted in Velasquez's portrait painting at the Met. Art commissions were used to bring people to faith, and the cast of characters who fulfilled them led interesting lives. John Bologna was a Flemish sculptor who came to Florence to study. He was so good at his craft that the Medici family did not allow him to leave ever, and he died in Italy an old man. Then there's Caravaggio. Aside from being a master of chiaroscuro, he was notorious for his scandalous behavior, such as carrying a long sword, although he's not nobility. He killed a man and fled to Naples. Also, poisoning was a thing. There was a failed assassination attempt against Cellini, the valuable diamond dust that was supposed to be used to kill him was exchanged for glass, and though he suffered, he survived. What I find extraordinary about these masters is their ability to use simple elements of the earth and create their masterpieces, true alchemy. A lot of what's used to make paintings are everyday ingredients you can find in your kitchen. Egg yolk for egg tempera, milk for casein, the flax plant gives us linen and linseed oil. Leave that oil sitting in the sun and it gets thicker, making stand oil. Pine trees give us turpentine and gum arabic, which is a binder used for ink and watercolor, which you simply add water to. Pigments come from all kinds of things. Lead white from lead, red oxide from rust, and traditionally, 
Indian yellow comes from the urine of cows who feast on a diet of mango leaves. To make drawings, one uses charcoal, which is essentially burnt wood, or graphite, a naturally occurring carbon. You can mix the powder form of both of these with alcohol on paper made from organic pulp of wood and cotton laid out on a tray to dry. And to make sculpture, we take the earth itself. Terracotta, clay from the ground, stone from the mountains, glass from sand, add fire, plaster from gypsum, and bronze, a mixture of copper and other mined metals. Then there's the tools of application. Brushes made of animal hair, sticks, there's hammers, chisels, and knives, all made by human hands for thousands of years. We have so much more available to us now. The color palette has vastly expanded. We have neons and resins, we have the internet, we have 3D modeling software, and robots that can do our work for us. I often remind myself, we are learning from the old world in order to create the new. And who better to teach us than the incredible professors here at the Academy? Our sincere gratitude for you, to you all for your passion and dedication. It takes a specific intelligence to teach art, to translate these concepts for students, some more abstract than others. So thank you. These concepts that I'm talking about are like uh, composition, sense of light, rhythm, atmosphere, color interaction, temperature, this is complicated stuff, and you are a special breed to carry on this lineage. Seeing all the teachers together, dressed in all black, like proper New York artists, hanging out outside the steps on Franklin Street, I thought to myself, they look like a band of rebels who have emerged from a time machine. But from what era, I don't know. Have they come from the future to save art? Or have they come from the past to preserve old magic? Whatever it is, I'm here for it. The history of art may be linear, but our experience of it is not. As culture makers, we straddle the past and the future, with some say in the present of how things shape up, if we choose to accept the responsibility. It is not an easy job, and though we may not have to dodge being poisoned by our competitors, there are powerful forces, like the art market, and our own needs for survival and validation, that influence us and the conversations we decide to participate in. Today is a beautiful day. We are surrounded by our community, and I am so proud of everyone here, of everything you have done to make it to this moment. I want you to remember this feeling, because in the day in and day out, it will not always feel this great. The more you put yourself out there, which you should absolutely do, the more chances you have of feeling misunderstood. And it's a bit painful, but it's part of the job. I want to share something with you. It's a bit of a visualization exercise. I have a place in my mind, and I go there whenever I want. I want you to imagine a room. For me, it looks just like a small movie theater in the village. It can be any room. Inside the room is your audience. The audience can be whoever you want it to be, people you care about, people you respect, people in your artistic lineage. For me, it's Laurie Anderson, Helma Off Clint, Frida Kahlo, Georgia O'Keeffe, Agnes Martin, Buffy St. Marie, whoever. Anyone whose work or life has ever inspired you, put them in the room. Then your, there's your birth family and your chosen family, your ancestors, your friends, those who have supported you, made you feel seen, those who have looked out for you, encouraged you, helped you without you asking, or answered the call when you did. People who you miss, who are no longer with us. They are there too. Then there's your education family, your teachers and mentors, who taught you how to see, how to perceive, asked you what you thought, what you were interested in, asked you what your ideas were, believed in your potential, and inspired you to keep going. Who generously shared with you everything they had to give, expecting nothing in return. And in that room, I also include multiple iterations of myself from different chapters of my life. Me as a four-year-old, as a middle schooler, as a high schooler, me in my 20s. All of me, I am there, cheering me on and holding myself accountable to stay authentic. This place in your mind, you always have access to it, and it's flexible. 
So when you feel like the world isn't giving you that immediate gratification or feedback, which it often doesn't, the algorithm hates you and you're not getting enough likes on Instagram, go to that room and check in with your people and talk to them about what you've been working on. Stay connected to your true path and don't get distracted by all the noise. Work hard, play hard, live your life. Go to museums, they are your sanctuary. Go for long walks, go to comedy shows, laugh, make friends in different fields, have interesting conversations, ask questions, stay curious. Remember, you are not a human printer, you are not a machine, you are a butterfly. Find your expression, read books, cook, go on adventures, go on a hike, have a positive impact on those around you, care about people, give a damn, fall in love, be vulnerable, be love, be creative in everything you do. Art making is more than producing objects for a marketplace. It is a mindset and a way of shaping culture. Believe it, I believe in you. Paintbrush drop. Well done. Definitely the best ending we've had to a speech. It's now my very great honor to introduce our speaker for today, legendary artist Joan Semmel. Joan uh, has centered her painting practice around issues of the body, from desire to aging, as well as those of identity and cultural imprinting. In the early 70s, she turned to figurative painting, not knowing that she would eventually end up speaking here to us, um, but constructing compositions in response to pornography, popular culture, and concerns around representation. Her practice traces the transformation that women's sexuality has seen in the last century and emphasizes the possibility for female autonomy through the body. She, in the 70s, embraced a more realistic style and began to use her own body as her subject shifting the perspective from that of an observer to a more personal point of view. Since the late 80s, she has meditated on the aging female physique. Recent paintings continue the artist's, her, her exploration of self-portraiture and female identity, representing body doubled, fragmented, and in motion. Her paintings are in the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Modern Art, the Tate in London, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, among others. Joan, we're so happy to have you with us. Uh, good afternoon uh, to Elena Guggenheim, Peter Drake, David Kratz, members of the board, and the students whose commencement is being celebrated, to and to their family and friends who have joined us here today. It's a great honor for me to be here with you on the occasion of your graduation from the New York Academy of Art. I know that both the real and symbolic meanings of this commencement are very important to all of you. Graduation represents the completion of a course of study with all the hard work that that implies, designed to prepare you for your future life. It also sadly ends a time of community and singleness of purpose with your fellow students and faculty, which hopefully will remain with you as, fine, as fond memories of a shared past, much like those of a first love, perhaps this time, you have, this time you have spent here will provide a desirable model for new communities equally committed to ideas and principles of action. The future is by definition unknowable. Occupations that have been with us from the time of the Industrial Revolution are suddenly no longer relevant Methods of distribution have changed radically. Populations shift. Life expectancy changes. Our cars have learned to drive themselves. The very earth shifts under our feet. 
the rapid changes in the way we experience our lives due to the accelerating speed of the digital revolution and the many uses of artificial intelligence create a future which shatters our preconceptions, stimulates our imaginations, and creates new problems that need to be solved. Why then do we still elect to make art? What is there in the studio, besides the model, of course, which so fascinates us? From the very beginning of human existence on Earth, people have always felt the need to make a mark on the wall of the cave, to fashion a tool, to ornament their appearance. Those impulses are still with us. The magnetic pull of making a work from our own simple need to create something springs from some, in, some inexplicable compul compulsion. The need to aestheticize our external environment and to symbolize our inner experience remains one which defines us as human. The art and artifacts that a culture produces are those which define it down through the ages. An art education completely changes one's life. Art and culture of the past and present become a living and breathing force. The enlargement of one's aesthetic experience totally changes the color and taste of one's desires, the way one lives, the way one sees. The total immersion in the many facets of art making awakens the passion and appetite, opens the door to the challenge of taking risks and of exploring new ideas. The dedication and commitment necessary to produce work of meaning and value is at the core of the project, and even more alive in the changing and dangerous environment in which we find ourselves. Artists often feel themselves to be outsiders. The role of outsider is in some ways essential. It is where the, those creative decisions that break all previous ground are born. It is the genetic cell of resistance to conformity, of sensitivity to symptoms of decay and disease in old rules and structures, and of empathy and openness to the new. It is where the hidden tremor of the zeitgeist is felt in the radar of one's nerve endings, often long before it becomes self-evident to others. Art keeps being made whether or not there is a market for it. Perhaps that is because it is most essential for the spirit of those who make it. The obsessive nature of the involvement, the sheer joy of bringing a difficult work to resolution is a real high, an addiction unmanaged, unmatched by any other. That process of engagement is one which remains constant throughout one's life. As much as we would like to have a studio and do our own work, we must also find ways to live, to interact with others, to contribute to the family and people we love. The opportunities for employment using some of the new technologies are exploding in a world of hyper-visualizations and animations. The fusion and crossing over of disciplines and stage productions, performances, and of film, design, fashion, writing, dance, video, prove innumerable ways of functioning and using one's talents. Flexibility and creativity have become major survival tools in the rapidly changing demands of the marketplace in all professions. The qualities that we develop as artists serve us well in such an environment. We never know when things we need to do for reasons of economy or survival open new doors to us that enlarge our visions and move our practices onto different paths. Change provides stimulation and promotes growth. 
it can also force us to dig in our heels and resist. Either way, we must each find our own balance. Upon graduation, one moves out from the school community and enters the larger art community, which although factionalized by different intellectual and political positions and aesthetic and tribal preferences, nevertheless speaks a language understood across the whole world. The influence art can have culturally and its real impact is often affected by the issues and ideals that drive the work. Despite the unfortunate reactionary nationalism in some places, art has forged many international connections of museums and schools, welcoming students from many different cultures. The cross-fertilization stimulates dialogue and understanding and has enriched us all. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to live overseas for seven and one half years, to travel and exhibit and be involved with artists in the culture of other countries way back in the 60s. That experience was very formative in my development. I doubt that you can imagine how different things are today from the time when I left school. Yet the lives that we live affect the work we make. So it is important, I think, for me to trace my journey a bit in the hope that it may be relevant and useful to you and during yours. My experience as an artist had begun at the height of the abstract expressionist fever. I was excited and energized by the engagement with pure paint and had plunged with full heart into all its seductions. The early years of my career were as an abstract expressionist, and that work was exhibited in Spain and South America. The political ferment which the Vietnam War generated in the US and the subsequent awakening of the civil rights and then the women's movement were profoundly influential in provoking my reconsideration of representation as a viable expressive tool. Upon my return to New York, my native city, in 1970, my life changed totally, and I began to question many of my previous choices. I had two children and a broken marriage under my belt, but I was determined to make a life at the center of the action. I returned to school at Pratt to get an MFA so that I would be able to teach and support myself and my children. I felt a stranger in my own land at first. Soho at the time was a factory district where some artists lived illegally in unfurnished, unfinished empty loft spaces, ideal for studios, and carved out living amenities within them. I found a loft in a factory building, which I was able to rent for a pittance and where I mean, remain until this day. The city at that time was a cauldron of activity. It was both dangerous and exciting. I looked for an artist community with whom I could identify. Art worker coalition groups were open to all and met regularly one could get a feel of the current art scene there. I met many artists, writers, and many women artists. The women's movement in the art world was just beginning. My time living in a dictatorship had made me sensitive to the personal con consequences of an authoritarian system and the restricted position of women within that society. Separate meetings of women artists began to take form so we could address our own issues. We gathered each week in different studios where we could see each other's work. Very few women were able to get visibility in the gallery and museum world at that time 
or for that matter, secure graduate school entry and teaching jobs, which sustained so many male artists. We exchanged stories of exclusion, networked for opportunities, wrote articles, did historical research, collected and shared slides, had panels and discussions about relevance, supported each other's work and accomplishments, and pressured the system for inclusion. Friendships which formed during those early years of struggle have lasted throughout my art and personal life. Although it is from different vantage point, as many of us are now well known, we are still pressuring for equal inclusion along with young women who are just starting out. The sense of community built during the discussions, disagreements, achievements, and failures of those years have helped us all persevere during the many years of backlash. My fellowship grant in the MFA program at Pratt gave me the opportunity to draw from the nude model. As a pianist might practice scales, so that the nude as a genre became my natural point of departure. The so-called sexual revolution was in full swing in that golden age before AIDS, and sexuality was a logical but much more radical place to begin. After two groups of sexual paintings, I moved to the self-image. I was challenging what years later in critical discourse came to be called, quote, the male gaze. By exploring the emotional and political implications of representations of the female body, I had hoped to subvert the tradition of the nude from within. Artists are believed by others to have secrets, to be magicians. We don't seem to fit in the boxes constructed to mere mortals. Those secrets hide the times of self-doubt, trial and error, fear of failure, and enormous risk-taking before a new idea comes to fruition. We all struggled with what do I do next? How can I do something better than what I have just done? That never changes. One must learn to be able to deal with rejection, to have the confidence to hear criticism and evaluate it must have the ego to not let it define you and the strength to believe in and act on your own convictions. The future today is for all of us fraught with unexpected surprises and fearful possibilities. We are living in a time which we never thought would come once again to threaten the social gains and freedoms which were achieved with so much effort. History has taught us by horrendous examples that the warnings must not be ignored. Simple non-attention could destroy the very planet. We all need to share the responsibilities of being citizens of a free society. We cannot be paralyzed by apathy or fear. There have been difficult and dangerous times in the world before within my own life experience. We are just on the very edge of massive changes due to the expansion of knowledge in all areas. These destabilizations can provoke incredible leaps of the imagination and solutions to human needs and problems, as well as reactive and regressive manifestations of primitive impulses. Young people face fabulous opportunities, but also enormous challenges. Boredom is not on the menu. A work of art by some mysterious process assumes an identity of its own. It can display a technical expertise and on the other hand, break all the rules. It can be specific, but hopefully will not be pedantic. It can be direct, but ambiguous and mysterious at the same time. Art provides a place of refuge and joy, of self-discovery and affirmation, as well as a place of resistance and confrontation. 
It also provides a community of spirit, a common language, and an aspiration to the high ideals that civilization has offered. Perhaps art cannot change the world, but it makes it a much more livable and interesting place. Your education here at the Academy has given you all the basic tools with which to develop yourselves as artists and become whoever it is you would like to be. The rest is up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. That was beautiful and inspiring. Very difficult act to follow, but I'd like to announce special awards. The Academy is fortunate to have the support of its patrons, trustees, artistic community. We have an impressive list of awards and scholarships that can be found in the commencement program. For instance, this year David Schaefer gave $200,000 to the Artists of Excellence Scholarship to attract the highest performing applicants to the MFA program. Additionally, 31 named scholarships combined to raise over 500,000 in support of Academy programming. Also, we have the support of so many in our community, including museums, art supply stores, and foundations, all of which made it possible to offer in-person instruction for the entire academic year. The Academy is pleased to continue its partnership with Chubb Insurance as the title sponsor of the fellowship program. The Academy awards the Third Year Fellows and Residence Award to three outstanding individuals each year. The fellowship allows these artists to spend one postgraduate year in residence at the Academy. We are thrilled to announce that this year's fellowship has been restructured to offer one of the three fellowships to an alumnus who has been out of the school for at least one academic year. The Chubb Fellowships for the year 2022 and 2023 are granted to Zachary Lank, a graduate from the class of 2018, and Annie Legnini and Audrey Rodriguez, both graduates from the class of 2022. We will now confer the Master of Fine Arts degrees. Please stand. Okay. Assem Mustafa Ahmed. Carolina Amarillo. Thank you. Jessica Capobianco. Jacob Child. Ryan Davis. Jackie Doika. Charles Feeney. <laughs> Sonia Renee Fuenzalina. Fuenzalina. <laughs> Dimitri Galbachiani. Thanks. 
Emma Hapner. Monica Ikegwu. <laughs> Alessandro Lovato. <laughs> Liza Little. Amy Liu. <laughs> Vitali Lopez. <laughs> Lee Martin. Elise Mills. <laughs> Jill Moss Getz. Anna Grace New. <laughs> Brian Pennington. <laughs> Catherine Pope. Lucy Rahner. <laughs> Salome Rigvava. <laughs> Audrey Rodriguez. Megan Lee Scougard. <laughs> Kylie Baker Snow. <laughs> Dina Sturm. Ariel Hannah Tessarario. <laughs> Pedro Troncoso. <laughs> Edward Vasquez. Kelvin Wallace. <laughs> How long? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Patricia Wonkar. Jim Zhu. Shishen Zhao. And in absentia, uh, Ellen Jones and Antoinette Legnini. We will now confer the honorary doctorate degree. Joan Semmel, having revitalized figurative painting since the early 70s by celebrating female sexuality and exploring the aging female body, has been recommended by the faculty and trustees of the Academy and is hereby granted the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts. Thank you. Okay, the moment you've all been waiting for. By the authority vested in me, by the New York State Board of Regents, the National Association of Schools of Art and Design, the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, and the Board of Trustees of the New York Academy of Art, I declare you graduates of the Master of Fine Arts program of the New York Academy of Art, entitling you to all the rights and privileges pertaining to your degree. Congratulations. <laughs>